I would like to thank the kind invitation of the Anglican Association of Biblical Scholars and Daniel for having me here to facilitate a discussion on teaching in context. The emphasis here is on facilitate, since in terms of formally teaching in a university-like setting, my accumulated experience in teaching the Bible is but only three years. Perhaps a little more about myself. I am Malaysian by birth, brought up in Singapore, and currently now residing in Hong Kong, teaching in the local Anglican Theological College here. The college carries several degree programs, but the ones I am heavily involved in is delivering the BTH and MTH programs, which is conferred by Charles Sturt University based in Australia. My students largely come from an East Asian background. Majority are local Hong Kongers who mostly have had some form of English education some local students are first-generation immigrants from the UK. There are also some students from Taiwan and mainland China, and not to mention a few Americans, both Chinese and white. With this all but brief sketch of the context that I am in, let me now press on with highlighting a few points for our discussion today. As I've argued elsewhere, context should be first thought of as boring Lorraine code, primarily an epistemic terrain, rather than an ontological state. That is to say, context is about reading, or in this case teaching, the Bible from or in a geopolitically defined space, rather than reading or teaching the Bible as, say for me, a Singaporean or quasi-Hong Konger. The distinction is important because it holds on to the notion of what Jose Medina has argued as polyphonic contextualism which means, among many other things, that any single context is a heterogeneous space that cannot be reduced to any single person, or for that matter, a single institution. If you like, we could talk more about this in our discussion, but in the interest of time, I wish to press on. The two discursive spaces I like to explore is first, the curriculum, and second, the classroom. It might surprise some of us, that the dominant identity which still populates most of our reading lists are white bourgeois men, which for biblical studies seem to be more alive than dead. The problem this poses to contextualizing the Bible in the classroom is that very often their questions and concerns about biblical texts are crowding out, or worse, addressed at the expense of local questions and concerns about biblical texts. On this note, one wonderful thing that has come out of this pandemic is that while we are isolated from the people in our own local context physically, there has been an increase in connectivity across different localities. Here I wish to caveat this point by stating that we should still be cautious not to flaunt our privilege that despite the gains of the internet, not everyone has the means to become connected. In this light, I see my responsibility as continuing to spread the message and contributing to transnational solidarities around the issues that ought to connect us. One such happy outcome of this act of transnational solidarity online is a recent conference I attended organized by the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture called Dismantling Whiteness, Critical White Theology. From the perspective of someone in the Global South, such a discussion is, to put it ever so mildly, overdue. As Anthony Reddy, one of the organizers of this conference mentioned in the opening, whiteness and the academy have been discussed in the wider university for almost 30 years, but there has been hardly any penetration into theological and biblical studies. Using this conference as a conversation starter, I would like to think about the whiteness of the curriculum of biblical studies. Let us take a quick peek at the state of knowledge production, which might serve as an indication on the kinds of curriculum that ultimately gets taught in the classroom downstream. Here I've chosen the upcoming annual meeting by Society of Biblical Literature as a preliminary site of inquiry. It is most certainly an achievement to see context being featured as program units. There is a greater salience of words such as contextual, together with identities and their associated geopolitical realities, such as Africa, Asia, Chinese, Islanders, Korean, Latino, Latina, Latinx, and not to mention social identity markers, such as feminist, minoritized, womanist, 
and even one program unit that outrightly begins with the word racism. Two program units named whiteness as an important site of inquiry, the Forum on Missional Hermeneutics and Paul and Politics. The presence of whiteness here might indicate a move away from what Stephen Moore and Yvonne Sherwood have described in their book, The Invention of the Biblical Scholar, A Critical Manifesto, as disjoint sets, where old school historical criticism is kept pure from the postmodern turns in biblical studies, and perhaps an ever so tiny chink in the wall which they polemically call enable and ignore. The postmodern, regardless of how broadly or narrowly one defines it, is still problematic from a decolonial standpoint, but I shall put that aside for now. Moving downstream into putting together a curriculum on, say, introduction to the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, the textbooks written, or at least those I have access to, do not seem to reflect very much these broader developments something that Greg Carey also notices with major introductory texts in New Testament studies. On occasion, we might catch fleeting glimpses, and please forgive me if I mispronounce any of these names, of Musa Dubé, Mediopoint Messenye, Teresa Okura, Randall Bailey, Archie Lee, Rasia Sukitaraja, Kokpulan, Fernando Segovia, Yorke Bixley, Elsa Thomas, just to name but a few as ghosts in the main text and footnotes could also be said that feminist scholarship suffers a similar fate in these introductions seemingly driven by questions of source and form criticism. Being relatively new to teaching, I dare not speculate, but love to hear what everyone here thinks as the reasons why the textbooks seem to relegate these developments to the margins of Ellie's early undergraduate work. In my context, the common reason I hear is that it is something only for advanced students after they have gotten their foundation right. I have to caveat here that this is about, paraphrasing Deepesh Chakrabarti, provincializing whiteness rather than rejecting it. Because like all positionalities, white men are still as capable of producing good knowledges as they are of problematic ones. Of course, whiteness here does not primarily revolve around the idea of representation, as Denise Kimber Buell points out, reducible to skin colour, but rather the power of a discursive formation that today no longer needs to rely on numbers to sustain itself. That being said, I also agree with Chen Kuan Singh in an important book to those of us reading the Bible in Asia, entitled Asia as Method, toward the imperialization, who recognizes that our formations as people in Asia have become too dependent on whiteness, and by stripping it away as it were, we might risk becoming crippled. I personally do not think that it is desirable to do to the white men what they have done to us. Speaking for my context, what I need to do is not to erase the white man's voice but using a Chinese idea, bring it into balance and harmony with other voices in our context. To move from Hmong singing Gregorian chants to musicians in the Chinese orchestra that incidentally today includes the cello and the double bass. That being said, my concern here is discussing strategies in curriculum development that includes contextual voices. So I'll press ahead to how I have tried to circumnavigate this heavily colonized space. One useful development I was exposed to towards the end of my doctorate studies was how biblical studies in southern parts of the United Kingdom were moving to introducing the Bible based on themes. I found this to be exceedingly useful. This is a quick peek of the themes I've chosen for my context, but I'm sure many of you here have much better frameworks. Privileging themes allow students to appreciate the bigger questions in the biblical canon. When I shifted to a thematic approach, my experience is that most of the textbooks that privilege a book-by-book -book approach tend to be limited in lending themselves to such a framework. Of course, this entails more work on my part, as there are very few texts that have consolidated work done into these themes for undergraduate teaching into one single text. 
I can no longer get away with just using one textbook for more than 90% for an introductory course. A happy problem though, in my opinion. More importantly, it allows me the flexibility of tailoring introductory courses on the Bible to the needs of the contents. A good example is the theme of land and nationalism which creates a third space for me to discuss more broadly about the issues of nationalism in Asia. It also allows me to spotlight the contributions of minorities, such as Native American and Palestinian scholars on this issue. Other examples will be using mythologies as a way to bridge the text to Chinese myths, connecting floods with the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami through the frame of sin and punishment, exodus with liberation movements in South Korea and India, and so on. Just as pertinently, I can also bring the text to bear on problems in our context as well. An example here is by devoting one lesson to women in the Bible, I'm able to foreground the issue of patriarchy, which often goes unaddressed in many Asian contexts. I have done more in other courses I teach at the master's level, such as contemporary approaches to the Bible and reading the Bible in the third world. But much as I try to reshape the curriculum, I have to concede that this is more or less a lonely endeavour. I also have to battle against time, because it is so much more expedient to just teach chapter by chapter from a textbook, sanctioned by the institution. As I raise later, making the material more accessible and relevant entails more preparation. Yet despite my best efforts, I find that I still fail to meet most of at least my own expectations of a decolonized curriculum. At the very bare minimum, I remind myself that at all times, I ought to inspire in my students as early as possible a deep dissatisfaction about the current state of knowledge on the Bible. If there really were nothing else, then at least let my discontentment set them free to connect biblical texts to context in powerful and meaningful ways. This has led to some remarkable contributions from my students. One such contribution I wish to highlight is how they constantly bring to my consciousness the presence of Chinese texts. The examples I've shown here are by a secular scholar, Feng Xiang, who has translated the Pentateuch with the literature, Isaiah, and the New Testament. It has been wonderful to see how Chinese styles of writing do make a big difference to how the texts are translated since the standard Chinese versions used in churches are still done in the shadow of English translations. And just last week, my students sent me a Chinese translation of One Enoch, which blew my mind because I never thought that such peripheral texts, even within Western biblical studies, would get enough attention to be translated. Overall, my assessment is that what I've done to decolonize the way my students learn about the Bible is modest at best. It is my hope that this is more of an excuse for me to hear about everyone else's contributions to decolonizing the curriculum of biblical studies. Very quickly, I would also like to talk about the classroom. Returning to the idea of context as epistemic terrain, the place of the classroom is already inscribed by certain norms, even before you or I, much less our students, have entered it. As I've argued elsewhere with respect to reading strategies and the planetary imagination, it naturally favours the ideology of objectivism, most optimally embodied in traditional historical criticism. The only contender it concedes to is if it em emanates from other white male centres, or say systematic theology and or church tradition. In this slide, I begin with the privilege as the instructor. Teaching in East Asian contexts, I find that there are at least two interrelated issues. On the one hand, as mentioned earlier, many students still struggle with the colonized mind, which includes a subconscious urge to revere, if not defend, the knowledge of white men. On the other hand, the Confucianist underpinnings of East Asian societies valorizes the instructor as the gentleman, and therefore, as it were, earned the right to discipline inferior bodies into certain habits of learning. One of the ways I've tried to dislodge this is to consciously get my students to find their own voice. I remember when I first started teaching here, one of my students in the one-to-one -one consultation told me that she found my assignments hard because she was not used to thinking about her own questions. She told me that her education thus far has largely been about answering the questions the teacher poses. 
In other words, it becomes a kind of cat and mouse game on the part of the student, as he or she is continually guessing what the lecturer wants. Another way of decentering the instructor is to consciously operate outside of what is most comfortable to me, my so-called areas of specialization. By putting myself in a relatively disadvantageous position, it forces me to listen more carefully to what my students are saying to me. If I were to sum this up conceptually, the lecturer is often portrayed as the reference point to which students have to aspire to. In order to do so, they have to mimic and become the instructors. Caught in this double bind between the colonized and Confucianized mind, I've tried some strategies to both liberate and democratize the classroom space, and I'm more eager to hear if others have better suggestions. In the interest of time, please forgive me for being too brief on the following points. As mentioned earlier, while I do have to give credit for the work done within dominant paradigms of biblical studies, I also consciously try to model critique of these cherished sources, particularly commentaries, the work of archaeology, philology, and also to consistently highlight the limitations of dating, source hunting, and even identifying the genre of the text. It is particularly to deconstruct the social identities that have been obfuscated in these writings so as to create discursive spaces where students do not need to feel ashamed to connect their own lived experiences, particularly as women or ethnic minorities, to their reading of texts. As Hiram Kim Crack points out in Whiteness in the Implicit Curriculum of Biblical Studies, we also have to pay attention to the parts of our teaching that are often subconscious to us. Here yeah, I agree with her with respect to the power of the visual image, and try my best to avoid pictures that valorize white skins and icons, preferring instead Asian, African, and South American images. But as you can imagine, this is not always possible to, teach, to reach as an optimum balance that does not overly favor white aesthetics. Language remains a challenging area for me in the context of Hong Kong, and also my own home country of Singapore, where I did a short stint of adjunct teaching where I had several international students. I have to thank this abrupt shift into online teaching because out of fear that students might not be able to listen to the lecture owing to technical difficulties, I have resorted to recording my lectures. This led to one of my greatest discoveries of my teaching career, YouTube subtitles allow for translation. All I need to do is to upload my transcript, and YouTube Studio will do the rest for me. The feedback of many non-native English speakers is that they found this to be immensely useful, even when they just read the English subtitles. This has the other effect of freeing up time to read biblical texts instead with my students during classroom sessions. This is so that I can favor biblical texts that people from the Global South are reading and in some small way show how they have read such texts in their own context, such as reading Feng Xiang's translation of Genesis 3 together, focusing on texts with minority figures, such as Hagar, Shipra, and Pua, and texts such as Exodus 5 as a reflection on modern-day slavery. On reading Feng Xiang's translation, by the way, many of my students will agree with me that it reads more like mythology, as opposed to the official Chinese translations, they seem closer to what we might consider a news report or a historical account. Most certainly, I'm not always successful, but I will continue trying. Here I encourage them to come to class with their own questions about the text, because ultimately, echoing Gayatri Spivak, I do not believe that we can change minds, especially about the Bible, but we can rearrange desires. The hope here is that I can do so through the kinds of questions they're asking. In sum, the goal for me in terms of pedagogy is to shift the idea from the teacher as curios to teacher as fellow traveller, albeit a few steps ahead. From producing passive recipients of knowledge to empowering students as co-creators of knowledge. Clearly, what I've presented here is far from perfect, so I shall keep quiet now and look forward to hearing about your experiences circumnavigating whiteness in order to contextualize the curriculum and pedagogy in your own context. Thank you.